So Revelation chapter 11. Let's read a few verses here and then let's pray and then you guys can have a seat. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time we've had today to come and worship you, to learn of you as we desire right now. And we pray that in this time, looking at Revelation 11, you would speak to us, you would show yourself. Lord, your word would just become clear and it would be applied to our hearts and our lives, Lord, and what we're facing and going through here today. And so bless us now by your spirit, we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> you guys can have a seat. All right. Revelation 11. We're about halfway through our study in Revelation now, and we find ourselves <clears throat> about halfway into the tribulation period now. Remember, as we've been going through this, three waves of judgments coming, the seven Seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven bold judgments. The seventh seal judgment opens up the seven trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet judgment opens up the seven bold judgments. And in between each of those three ways of judgments, there's a bit of an interval, a bit of an intermission, if you like, where God's kind of filling in more details, more of the scenario as to what is going on. Well, in chapter 11 here, we are still in that interval point between uh, the sixth trumpet judgment, the seventh trumpet judgment. The seventh trumpet judgment hasn't gone yet, but when it does, it's going to usher in the seven bold judgments. So we're looking at a bit of a situation as to what's really been going on so far, looking back at some of the things that we've already talked about and filling in more detail now. And that's what we're seeing in Revelation 11. And, and John is given some very interesting stuff to do right off the bat here. Notice it says that he was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, perhaps the angel that he saw come down from heaven in chapter 10, standing upon the sea and the land. Remember that? And he had that book in his hand that John was to take, right? And so perhaps this angel now <clears throat> tells him to measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Now, in this day, they would take a uh, a reed, like a rod that grew very straight and tall like bamboo. They would cut it to different measurements, and this would become like their measuring rod in a sense. So John's told to take one of these things now and go to the temple and measure it out. Go to the temple, but wait a second. What is this telling us here? It tells us that there's going to be a temple rebuilt sometime between now and the tribulation period because the Jews have been without a temple now for a very long time, since 70 AD, when it was destroyed by the Romans, they've been without a temple. You can go to Jerusalem today and see this large temple mount and everything. There's no temple there any longer. This is the one thing that the Jews have been desiring, longing for. They want this because this has been their most cherished of structures. It was a place that they would meet with God where sacrifices were made to atone for sin. Now, of course, we know as believers today, that all we need is Jesus, that he is that atoning sacrifice for us, that by faith in him and his work, we can and are saved. You see, we only need Jesus. He's the one that's forgiven us of our sins and brings us to the Father. But the Jews to this day are longing for that temple. One third, one third of the Torah's 613 commandments all revolve around them coming and offering sacrifice and ritual to the temple. So for them to be able to fulfill even their commandments, or a, a third of them, they realize that we need a temple. We need a temple to be able to do this. They're desiring, longing for it. And there's great hope and anticipation for their temple to be built again. So John comes in now again, measure this out. Now the act of measuring something communicates that there's ownership here. There's property it speaks of evaluation as well and the fact is that God is the one that owns this property this piece of real estate that is 
brought about great tension in the world today. But to go and measure something, it means that there's an evaluation being done, and it speaks of ownership. If I come walking into your house, into your living room with a tape measure, I start measuring something out, you know, you're sitting here going, what are you doing? And I say, I'm just, you know, measuring out my futon to see if it's going to fit in here. You'd be like, no, it's my place. What are you doing? Get that tape measure out of here, you know, and yourself as well. You're not welcome, right? But <clears throat> you wouldn't say that, would you? I wouldn't bring a tape measure. But if I did, I would be communicating that, listen, I have a right here, don't I? And so God is having John measure out the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. God is seeming to even mark those that are coming to him in worship during this time. Now, we also read in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 43 that Ezekiel also was called to go and measure out a temple. But that temple is seen as the millennial temple. The temple in Revelation 11 would seem to precede that temple that Ezekiel is talking about here. Many believe that this temple that's going to be built sometime between now and the, and the tribulation is referred to as the third temple, whereas the millennial temple is the fourth temple that is to come. Now, as we look through various scripture, we begin to see some references as well for us that begin to reveal that there is indeed to be a temple in place during this time. We're not just basing that upon what we see from Revelation 11, but throughout the scriptures, we see Scripture being spoken of, that kind of dictates, shows us that there's to be a temple built sometime before the coming of Jesus Christ. Look at what Daniel 9, 27 says. He was told to speak, uh, or this chapter here, this verse speaks of the, the prince of the people who will establish a covenant with the people for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, he will, as it says, bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. So we assume, again, that for there to be sacrifices and offerings made, that there must be a temple rebuilt. And this one that's going to bring in this kind of um, covenant for seven years would be speaking of the Antichrist, we believe. Well, Jesus also said, we'll talk about, more about that later, but Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15 to 16, again, speaking of the end times, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you see the abomination, the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, where's the holy place? It's in the temple. That's where the holy place was. So Jesus says, when you see this happening in the temple, flee. This is the time that's to come. Paul said also in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 to 4, that the Antichrist will seek to exalt himself in the temple. And he says here in that verse, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come on the scene. Everything's going to look very rosy, very nice. This guy's a great world leader. But halfway through the tribulation, he's going to show himself in the temple seeking to be worshipped as God. So a little history of the temple here, just again to get our, our bearings straight. Israel's first temple was built by Solomon on Mount Moriah back in 1050 BC. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and sacked that temple in 586 BC. Well, the temple was then rebuilt by Zerubbabel and many Jews that came back from captivity in Babylon, came back to Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple in 536 BC. And then, so that's known as the second temple then, basically, all right? Second temple. And then Herod came along now, King Herod, seeking favor with the Jews, uh, enlarged and expanded the temple, a project which took decades to complete. It was this temple that was standing in Jesus' day. And Jesus also said in Matthew 24, too, that no one sh no, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that word was fulfilled when the Romans invaded Jerusalem, led by Titus. And once again, the temple was destroyed. That happened in 70 AD. So some people refer to it as the temple that King Herod kind of, you know, revamped and uh, added on to, some people refer to that as the third temple. It's still the second temple. It's still the temple that was rebuilt by 
by Zerubbabel and those that came back from Babylon. Still, in my mind, seen as the, the second temple, but then it's destroyed. And again, to this day, they do not have a temple. But John, now in Revelation 11, very excitedly, is told to measure out the temple. Not measure out the, the temple to build it. He's measuring a temple that's already there. So by Revelation 11, the temple's been built. It's there. It's been in operation, I believe, through the tribulation period as sacrifices and offerings have been offered as we see in Daniel chapter 9. But John is told here now to leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it's been given to the Gentiles. Now this is interesting. A man by the name of Omar in the late 1600s built the Dome of the Rock Mosque on which the Jews believed was the former site of the temple's Holy of Holies, the very place where the the Ark of the Covenant sat and the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant where God would meet with his people and only the, the high priest could enter into one day of the year, right? And, and so Jews believe that the, the Holy of Holies sat right where the Dome of the Rock sits now today. That main feature that you see in the, the landscape when you're overlooking Jerusalem, right? Well, they believe that that was the place that it was, that it was, but Again, believing that this mosque was in the way, now rebuilding was not an option, of course. This has been something that has stopped the Jews from rebuilding the temple, of course, with this Dome of the Rock sitting there. It would have, for Jews to come in and try to enforce any way of trying to build a temple, it would just be to incite a, a holy war, all right, a jihad that has never been seen before, for Jews to come in and try to build a temple on the Temple Mount with the Dome of the Rock sitting there. However, recent research has uncovered some very interesting discoveries. Dr. Asher Kaufman, a physicist and archaeologist with the Hebrew University, spent 16 years studying that whole Temple Mount area. And he declared that while the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock, has been assumed to sit on the Holy of Holies site, the true location may actually be 100 meters to the north of the Dome of the Rock. What is 100 meters north of the Dome of the Rock? A small gazebo-like structure, which is called the Dome of the Spirit. Dome of the Spirit sits there on the Temple Mount, about 100 meters north of the Dome of the Rock. Now, this is very interesting, and, and you can go and, and, and stand right here on the Temple Mount if you come with us to Israel next year. A little plug for Israel, all right? We're going next year. End of February, beginning of March, we're going to be there, Egypt, Jordan, Israel tour, and uh, you can get right there by that Dome of the Spirit, take a picture, um, and walk around the Temple Mount. It's incredible to be able to be up there and see, again, just thinking about the history and the things that God has done here where the temple once stood. But this is very interesting. So below that gazebo-like structure, the Dome of the Spirit, Again, the only other place, the original bedrock of the temple is exposed. And as opposed to the jagged rock in the dome of the rock, however, the stone 100 meters to the north is flat, providing a much more likely setting for the Ark of the Covenant with the Holy of Holies. Let me bring up a little bit of an aerial. Here you see the temple mount, the dome of the rock sitting there. Now, not only more logical, this site seems more historical. You see, according to the Mishnah, the highly esteemed book of Jewish oral traditions, when the priest stood in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he could look through the veil, through the door, and see right through to the eastern gate directly in front of him. Very interestingly, the results of a secret excavation that took place in 1970 confirmed that the original eastern gate is directly below the present eastern gate. That makes Kaufman's assertion even more intriguing, for if you stand 100 meters north of the Dome of the Rock, you get to the Dome of the Spirit, and directly in front of it, you see the Eastern Gate, as is pointed out here in this slide. In other words, you see a place here where the temple could be built without any problem, most likely the exact same spot that it had always been. Very cool. And it's interesting that the very name of the gazebo-like structure, Dome of the Spirit, or as it's also called, Dome of the Tablets, somebody that named that dome seemed to think that there was some very intriguing history here. Dome of the Spirit, Dome of the Tablets, the Ark of the Covenant sat in the Holy of Holies, where what was in the Ark of the Covenant? 
The Ten Commandments, the tablets that God gave to Moses sat in the Ark of the Covenant. This was the place where God said, I will meet with you. The Spirit of God dwelt there in the Holy of Holies. Dome of the Spirit, Dome of the Tablets. Very interesting stuff to see the, the, what is going on here. And so somebody seemed to think that this was indeed the place where the Holy of Holies sat, where the tablet of Moses sat in the ark and the place where the Spirit of God hovered, marked by this dome of <laughs> the Spirit that, for most people, they'll walk up there and be like, what is this thing all about? I don't know. I'll just get a picture by it. It looks kind of cool. Most people won't know. Why is this here? Somebody's put the structure there, understanding the significance of it. So, guys, let's get back here. So if the temple were to be rebuilt today, in this spot, the Dome of the Rock then would actually be sitting in the outer courtyard of the temple. And now we see clearly why John is told here in Revelation 11, verse 1, to, or sorry, verse 2, to leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. We see very clearly why John was told to leave out that court, because it belongs to the Gentiles. Don't measure it, for it is not of the Lord. This has been given over. See, in other words, the Dome of the Rock does not have to go for the temple to be rebuilt. The Dome of the Rock can stay right where it is and yet still have a temple. Now, we see picture of the temple, and you get to see the, the big courtyard all around it, right? But the temple itself was not that huge, all right? There's different words that are used for the, the whole structure of the temple with the different courtyards and different things of that, and then just the temple that contained the holy place where the priest went in, the table of showbread, and the, um, the lampstands, the altar of incense, and then the veil that moved into the holy of holies. The temple that's been referred to is just re referring to that structure, a smaller structure that can easily fit up there. You don't have to worry about the court because God says, leave out the court. Leave out the courtyard. It's been given over to the Gentiles, the Dome of the Rock, sitting right where that would be, you see. So even today, guys, there's great anticipation by many Jews and Bible-believing Christians that the temple is going to be rebuilt soon. Preparations are going on today to make sure that when the green light is given for a temple to be rebuilt, things are already in place just to move in there. You can go to Jerusalem today and visit the Temple Institute, an organization that has already begun to create the different implements, the furnishings of the temple here. And they're there on display for people to go in and see. You can go and see the table of showbread that's going to be used in the temple. You can be right there. I've been there. Many of you guys have been there. It's exciting and fascinating. See the priestly garments that have been made already, woven the exact same way that they're told to in the Old Testament. The altar of incense, the lampstand or menorah are already there in place. Many pieces of the furnishings are already in place. Priests are being trained up right now. They're finding families from the line of, of Kohen, the uh, uh, Levitical line, I believe it is. I might have that a little bit mixed up, but something like that. They're training up priests right now to be ready to serve in the temple that they believe, as the Bible teaches, as we're reading today, is going to be rebuilt. Exciting times that we're living in, guys, right now. So once again, in case you missed it, come to Israel next year. You'll see all of that. It's going to be good. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the Jews are very determined to see their temple rebuilt. It's not a matter of if, but when, isn't it? And, and this is what we see going on all around us. And it's exciting to see the Bible just coming to life when you go over there and see. And, and again, that's been a huge question. You know, how can the temple be rebuilt with the Dome of the Rock? The Dome of the Rock can never be moved. That's just going to create a holy war like nobody's seen before. I don't believe the Dome of the Rock has to be moved or touched. That's, again, now, uh, let me just say, we can ask ourselves, how will this be built? How, how can that happen with the, the Dome of the Rocks in there? How can the temple be rebuilt? That's what many people question. And again, this is where, guys, the Antichrist <laughs> comes onto the scene, as Daniel 9 tells us, because the Antichrist is going to come onto the scene, and he's going to develop a covenant, a peace treaty in a sense. He's going to be the one that, that's going to do what nobody else has been able to do, and that is to be able to bring an agreement between the Muslims and the Jews to say, Okay, Muslims, you got your Dome of the Rock. We're going to allow the Jews to build their structure, their place of worship, right here beside the Dome of the Rock. You don't have to we don't have to touch what you're doing. We won't get in your way. We're just going to build right over here. 
where it's just flat space, nothing's going on right now. People out there taking pictures, I don't know why, but we'll just build right there. And this is the role of the Antichrist. This is what he's going to do. He's going to come onto the scene and bring about this covenant, this peace treaty that nobody's been able to do. And I often wondered, why would the Jews go and, and reject the Messiah, Jesus, when he did come the first time? Why would the Jews reject Jesus, a good, loving Savior, and yet follow after one that's going to be an Antichrist? And I, like I say, I've been to Israel, and I've asked Jewish people, what is it that you're looking for in your Messiah? How will you know that this person that you follow is the Messiah? You know what they say? He will lead us in the rebuilding of our temple. That's going to be the thing that's going to trigger them to go, this guy is the one that we've been waiting for. This is the promised one of God. He's allowing us to build our temple that we've never been able to do before. That's why they're going to follow after the Antichrist. You see, sometimes we think the Antichrist is going to show up on the scene, he's going to have a long red cape, maybe a horn or two, and we're going to be like, why are you following this guy? The Antichrist is not going to come on the scene looking like that. He's going to come on very charismatic. He's going to bring favor or, or buy favor from many people. He's going to do something for the Jews that they've never been able to do. That is to see their temple rebuilt again on that site. And that's why many are going to follow after him and, and hail him as their Messiah. That's the role of the Antichrist. That's what Daniel talks about. For seven years, his covenant. But then he's going to break the covenant halfway through when he goes into the temple. And Jesus spoke of that. It's the abomination of desolation. When you see that, it's the Antichrist showing his true colors. Then the Jews will recognize this is not our Messiah. And Jesus tells them, forewarns them in Matthew 24, you flee to the hills, man. You run to the hills and get out of there because it's going to get intense now here on earth during that last part of the tribulation. And we're moving into that slowly here in our study of Revelation. And we'll get to that even a bit today, perhaps here. But so this is what's happening. The Antichrist is going to win them over. He's going to lead them in the rebuilding of the temple. And it says, notice that, uh, that they will tread, the end of verse 2, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Did I get that right? Because you people know by now, don't trust me on the math, right? Don't trust me on, did I get it right? 42 months, three and a half years, right? So again, we're seeing the, the dividing point here of that seven-year tribulation. John close, shows us clearly that we're moving into the last half of the tribulation. That reference, 42 months, three and a half years, is repeated, Revelation 11, 3, and chapter 12, chapter 13 as well. And this is going to be the time, like I said, when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel and shows his true colors. Anti-Semitism will peak, and the Gentiles will run roughshod over the temple and over the city of Jerusalem. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Because now the Jews have fled. They've realized what they've gotten themselves into with this man they've hailed as the Messiah, that he's not their Messiah, but he's bringing in a great war against the Jews and has completely blasphemed God in the temple. And they're going to run roughshod now over the city, over the temple here. Well, look at what God has in store here during this time and even much more before. Like we've commented on many times before, and I'll remind you guys again, as we go to the book of Revelation, boy, we're talking a lot about the judgment of God. It can sound very negative, very harsh, like God is a mean God. And, and, and a lot of people just look at that and go, man, I just don't want to get into this. But what we also have to see as we go through the book of Revelation, that's very clear here, as we see in, coming up in verse 3, that God is giving people an opportunity to repent of their sin and to get right with God so that they can be spared from the judgment that's coming. God doesn't just pour out judgment and say, well, too bad for you. He says, I'm bringing judgment, but I'm warning you ahead of time so that you can respond to me finally and get right with me that you might find life. God is a loving, gracious God. In wrath, he remembers mercy, as Habakkuk tells us. Well, look at what we see in verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Now again, we see again um, 1,260 days, 1,260 um, days here. It, Bible prophecy 
for the most part, is based on the Babylonian calendar, which was comprised of 360-day years, all right? 12, 30-day months, in a sense. That's how we get the number 1,260. It would seem that these two witnesses then appear around the beginning of the tribulation, and they minister throughout the first half of the tribulation, all right? They're prophesying against the work of the Antichrist, this man that's come onto the scene, and the work that's going on. And they're warning the world that what they're encountering, even in the first half of the tribulation, is the judgment of God. They're being warned that what you're seeing, earthquakes, you know, famines, and, and celestial wonders, I mean, what you're seeing is the judgment of God. Guys, repent. This is the hand of God here. Don't deny him. Turn to him. God is sending two of these incredible witnesses to come onto the scene at the beginning of the tribulation to prepare people. And warn people. Now, even though we're come up to the midway point of the tribulation, like I said at the beginning here, we see oftentimes in the book of Revelation going back and filling in details. And we're going all the way back to the beginning of the tribulation where God says, I've got two witnesses that I've raised up. And they're going to be preaching forth the truth so that people can hear it and have a chance to respond and to respond to God. Now, why two witnesses? Because the word of God says in Deuteronomy 19.15 that by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the matter be established. So, who are these two witnesses? <laughs> these two witnesses, there's been much speculation, much debate over who these two people are. The front runners are Moses and Elijah, representatives of the law and the prophets. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, uh, very instrumental and important for a Jew, the law and the prophets. So here's these two now representing these two. Many believe that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah who have come back, been sent back to the earth by God to carry out this specific purpose. Now Elijah stands out because Elijah had a similar ministry. Let me just read. Let's skip ahead to verse 5 a second. Notice what we see here. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Okay, so what do we see there? They have power to, you know, call down fire, to bring about um, a drought, hold back the rain, to bring about plagues as often as they desire. So again, Elijah stands out because he had a similar ministry like that, holding back the rain. He was, Elijah, interestingly, was carried up to heaven and never never died a physical earthly death, did he? Enemies of Elijah were destroyed by fire. It's prophesied that Elijah will return before the end of the age, as Malachi 4 tells us, and Elijah appears with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration, interestingly enough. The three disciples of Jesus recognized him. Moses also stands out because his ministry was also similar. He was the plague man, right? Called down plagues upon Egypt. That was Moses, and here they're calling down plagues at as much as they desired. God seems also to have a special purpose for the body of Moses that Satan wanted to defeat. There's a little uh, a verse in, in Jude 9 that you learn where Satan demanded Moses' body, but God had Michael the archangel take care of it. So there's a dispute that went on over the body of Moses. It seems like God maybe has a special plan for him. Enemies of Moses also destroyed by fire, number 16, verse 35. And Moses, along with Jesus and Elijah appeared with them at the Mount of Transfiguration. So Jesus had Moses and Elijah with them there on this important scene there, in the Mount of Transfiguration, very interestingly. So these two are the ones that stand out. They're kind of the front runners as to who these two witnesses might be, yet many names have been suggested. Enoch is also suggested because Enoch also walked with God and was not. He was taken up. He never died a physical earthly death just like Elijah. Now, many people use that verse uh, in Hebrews, it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. Everybody has to die. So Enoch and Elijah must be the two witnesses because they haven't died yet. So they got to come back to the earth so that they can die. But guess what? There's going to be thousands, millions perhaps that will never face death because of the rapture. We don't go up in the rapture to have to come back to the earth where God says, sorry guys, you didn't die. Got it. It's a formality. I just got to do it, right? I put in the word and now I got... No, it's not, a, it's not a requirement in a sense, just a typical natural law in a sense, right? So it doesn't mean that Enoch has to be it, but he's somebody that is thought of that could be coming back with 
Elijah. Now, some think it might be John the Baptist or Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, that were the two leaders in the building of the second temple. As we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit here. Some believe it might be John, even the writer of the Revelation. All, again, are very much speculation. We don't really know. Hey, listen, it could be just two random guys that are present and alive during the time of the tribulation that we don't know about. They don't have to be any biblical character. It could be one of you guys, but that would mean that you've missed the rapture, and that wouldn't be good. I hope it's not one of you guys, but maybe the Lord's holding you back for such a purpose as that. I don't know, but it could just be two random guys because we know that, again, he's going to have 144,000 Jews sealed, as we saw in Revelation 7, also set aside for a specific role of evangelizing during the tribulation. Some wonder maybe these two witnesses might be kind of the, the leaders or the representatives of these 144,000 because they're coming on the scene at the same time. In other words, God's building up quite a, a group of people here that are going to be faithful in sharing the good news and the gospel even during that time of his wrath and judgment being poured out. But these two witnesses, as we see, have some distinguishable um, marks of them and, and uh, qualities to them because we're going to see them doing some pretty incredible things. So who they are, we don't know. Many side with Elijah and Moses, and you'd be in good company if you did, but we can't say for sure. We're going to have to wait and see how it all unfolds. Isn't that going to be a fun time to sit and watch all that happening, right? I think we'll just be focused on worshiping Jesus at the throne. We're like, thank you for sparing me from all that. I'm just going to keep my eyes on you. But maybe we'll have a front row seat to all this and see it unfold. But notice there, again, we see in verse 4 that these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And that refers us to Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, in fact, turn, why don't you turn over to Zechariah 4? Zechariah chapter 4, because this is an interesting situation here again. I will read some verses here. Because in Zechariah 4, Zerubbabel had a vision of these lampstands and the olive trees. And we read there in Zechariah 4, starting in verse 1. Now the angel who talked with me came back and, and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. I pray that there's some angels doing that here this morning. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it. One at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who taunted me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? So I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so here we see this vision, these lampstands again. And it was a picture of how even for in that day, when they came back to Jerusalem, the temple is just a pile of rubble. And Zerubbabel is called to go and lead the people in the rebuilding of the temple. They're looking at this going, how are we going to do this? There's no way. This is just a pile of junk. We cannot do this. But the Lord raised up his people. He had Zerubbabel. He had Joshua, the high priest. These were the two olive trees, I believe, that were tapped into that supply, that continual supply of that oil that was being poured into them. It was to be a picture of that continual supply of the Spirit's power that was to enable them in the rebuilding of the temple, you see. That's why we read Zechariah 4, 6, great verse. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Goes on to say, it's my, my life verse in Zechariah. Do not despise the day of small things. My life verse right there. But um, they're looking at this going, how are we going to do this? This is never going to compare to the temple we once had. It says, don't despise these days. It's not by your might. It's by me and by my spirit empowering you, you see. And so too with these witnesses, it is a picture now for these next two that come onto the scene that they will have the ministry of the Holy Spirit empowering them to carry out the work of the Lord. 
Hey, guys, it's the exact same way that we carry out the work of the Lord, isn't it? We see what men and women have done in the Bible in the past, and we look at that and go, oh, wouldn't it be great to be living in those days? I think we're living in greater days. Because the Holy Spirit was poured out for specific purposes, specific tasks on people for a temporary time. But we have the ministry and the filling of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis to not just fill us, but to overflow us, to enable us to carry out the work that the Lord has. That's what Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1 verse 8, right? You take a guy like Peter, who's one night, you know, denying Jesus Christ, In a little while longer, he's up there preaching in the temple to all the people gathering together what's going on. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when, what? The Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what's going to happen? You shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Hey, guys, how fitting that is because today is Pentecost Sunday. You guys know that? I don't know if you knew that or not. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church. The day that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon God's people to enable them and empower them for the work of the ministry that God has for them. Hey, these two witnesses are doing some great things in this day. But the question is, what are we doing for the Lord today? What kind of witness are we being? Witnessing is not something you just go and do, as we oftentimes think it is. Being a witness is something that you are. Are you being a witness Are you being a witness for the Lord? And we need desperately to rely upon the Holy Spirit to do that, guys. We need the filling, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit to enable us. I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad that God didn't just say, hey, guys, go and figure it out. Take some courses or something. Just figure it out. Get get discipled or something and go and be witnesses. No, the Lord says, hey, guess what? I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me God's given us the ability he's given us the strength he's given us all that we need to be great men and women carrying out the work of the Lord it's through the filling of the Holy Spirit and that's what these people in Revelation are tapped into they're tapped into those two lampstands stand, or, or they're, these are the two olive trees just like we saw in Zechariah that are, are tapped into the lampstands with that continual flow of oil picturing the Holy Spirit. We have that continual flow and filling of the Holy Spirit accessible to us. Are we taking time to say, Lord, fill me? Are we taking time to say, Lord, pour your Holy Spirit in me and overflow me that I might be a witness of you? That what I do today, people are simply seeing you, Jesus. That's what being a witness is. That's what I desire. And I'm so glad he's not just left me of my own accord to do that. He's given me the Holy Spirit. He did that with these two in Revelation. He's done it with his witnesses in the past. Today, Pentecost Sunday, a reminder for us of what we have available to us, the Holy Spirit, where he began the church to be just that, a body of believers that are going out, sharing the word of God and being a witness of him. May we be doing that. And notice here, they're going about all these things, um, dressed in sackcloth. Interesting. At the end of verse 3, they're clothed in sackcloth. <laughs> they're going to need the, the help of the Holy Spirit because being dressed in sackcloth, man, is not going to be a comfortable thing for them, right? That'd be like putting on a, a potato sack, you know, with nothing underneath, right? And just like, it's itchy. It's uncomfortable, right? It's not good. They're going to need the filling of the Holy Spirit just to get through all this. But it's also a picture now when they would dress in sackcloth, it was a picture of of mourning and lamenting over sin and unrepentance towards sin, you see. And so these two are putting on a physical display of what the people that they're ministering to were to be doing, you see. The world that they're ministering to was greatly unrepentant of their sin. And so they're putting on a visual display of that and what they need to do. But again, sackcloth, uncomfortable item. And, 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 it can really rub you the wrong way, right? And that's what this message is going to do for the world. It's going to be rubbing them the wrong way. They're going to be hearing this, and they're not going to be too happy with it here. There would have been great opposition, and they would need to have the strength of the Holy Spirit to continue on. That's why, again, we need the Holy Spirit, because we're living in a world that opposes the truth. And if we're just going about things in our own wisdom, 
or strength or effort. Now, we're going to quickly feel defeated and want to give up. But we need the hope and the help of the Holy Spirit. We need the strengthening of the Holy Spirit to enable us to continue on to say, I'm not going to give up, man. The world opposes us, but that's, that's fine. They're not rejecting me, but they're rejecting who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And so the Holy Spirit's going to give these two strength, and this is going to be supernatural strength here as we see evidence as we move on here. Look at verse 5. We've read it right, but let's read it again. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of the prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So that's pretty incredible stuff. Maybe these two witnesses are like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone because it's starting to resemble a little bit more of a Hollywood script here, right? Fire proceeding out of their mouth. Arnold won't be saying, he'll be saying, he'll be back, right? Instead of I'll be back, right? He's coming, guys. Get ready. He'll be back. Um, But here we see fire proceeding from their mouth. I mean, this is getting pretty, pretty fun here, right? I mean, this is interesting stuff. It's the first witness protection program that we see going on right here. Fire coming up. Now, nobody... Like, like we read here, nobody's able to even lay a hand on them here because the Lord's given them these supernatural abilities that is going to protect them. Now, it's most likely that, now, you could go either way with this. Perhaps, again, they're physically able to breathe out fire from their mouth. Some of you have woken up with spouses where you're thinking that's what's happening right there. But um, I don't know if they're able to literally physically breathe out fire from the mouth. It could be a way of explaining that the word that's going forth has been like fire being poured out. It's what we read, read of in, um, in Jeremiah 5, verse 14, where it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it should or shall devour them. Also, we see in 2 Kings 1, 10, So Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men, And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So it could be that this word that's placed in the mouth has such authority that it's as though it's it's commanding fire. And at times when there's opposition coming, that fire's coming down from heaven. So it's either coming from heaven or it's literally coming out of their mouth. God's able to do that, right? I mean, that would be pretty awesome to, to witness that here. But either way, there's this protection that God has built in for them here to continue Uh, to see them continue on the work that God has for them. And look at verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, here we see the first of 37 references in the book of Revelation to this beast that is emerging now out of the bottomless pit pit here. He's the Antichrist that we're identifying here. Now, some believe when we talk about the beast arising on the pit, it's speaking of Satan, and no doubt uh, the Antichrist is going to be, for a time of tribulation, filled, empowered by Satan, no doubt. But the beast that we talk of, typically through the book of Revelation, is referencing the Antichrist, and he's more fully introduced to us and for us in Revelation 13, verse 1. So when we get to that chapter, we'll talk a little bit more about who this man is, this Antichrist. Nevertheless, he comes onto the scene and he makes war against these two witnesses now. And he can't do anything with these two witnesses, notice this, until they're finished their testimony. Verse 7, when they finish their testimony, now the Antichrist comes, makes war, overcomes them, and kills them. But when does he do that? When they have finished their testimony. In other words, guys, know, understand, bank on this, plant this deep in your heart. If you walk away with anything today, walk away with this, the Lord is in control. The Lord is in control. And nothing can happen to these two witnesses apart from the Lord allowing it. And so it is with you, so it is with me. Do you understand that today? That nothing can befall you, nothing can hurt you or harm you or overtake you until the Lord says, now is the time. I'm so glad for that. 
because we spend so much time worrying about this, fretting over that, afraid to go here, thinking, ah, I don't want to put myself in harm's way. And we fail to see that nothing can befall us apart from the Lord allowing it. Now, of course, there's common sense. Don't do anything stupid. Don't jump out of an airplane without a parachute thinking, oh, I'm in the Lord's hands. The Lord's going to sit there and go, you are an idiot. What are you doing? Now, if he wants to spare you, he can spare you. But common sense is also involved here. But nobody can do anything against you apart from what the Lord allows, you see. The Lord has a purpose for you that will be completed the Lord has a purpose for you that will be completed. Nothing will get in the way of that until you finish the work. Philippians 1, sex, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I love that. Being confident of that, guys. Are you confident of that? Are you confident that he who has begun a good work in you, and you're sitting here thinking, oh, I don't know of any work the Lord started in me. He died for you and saved you, guys. He's called you into his family. He has begun a good work in you. And guess what? He's going to finish that work. He's going to finish it. And you can bank on that. You can be confident. That. I love what George Whitefield said. We talked about this on Wednesday. He said, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. That's powerful. Hey, guys, you're living as immortal people until your work on earth is done. Until the Lord says, all right. My work is done in you. Let's go, Bobby. Come on home. Where we get to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The Lord is in control, guys. And man, I think about the, the hours, the days, or the years that we waste. Fearing and fretting and freaking out over every little thing. Thinking that we're the ones that has to protect our lives. We're the ones that has to sustain everything. We're the ones that needs to... Make everything happen. It's the Lord, guys. He's in control. He's sustaining you. He's holding on to you. He's protecting you. And he's going to finish that work that he began in you. You're living as immortals until the Lord says, ah, it's time now. So when the Lord allows it, these two witnesses are going to be killed. Their bodies will be left exposed in the streets. And again, it shows the disdain that people had towards these two witnesses because to not give anybody a, a proper burial was a very shameful, awful thing. People typically wouldn't do that. But they allowed the, the, their bodies to remain in the streets for this period of time. And, and Jerusalem here is referred to as that great city. It's likened to Sodom and Egypt, which speaks of immorality and worldliness. And so these witnesses are killed. But again, God's not done. We're going to wrap it up next time. We're going to end right there. But we're going to pick it up in verse 9, and we're going to see that the Lord has something even greater in store now. Who are these two witnesses? That's going to just rock the crowds that are forming and seeing all this happening here. Again, the Lord... You can never count out the Lord. You can never give up on the Lord. I wonder how many people would be looking at this going, oh, the two witnesses, they're dead. That's it. All hope is lost. You ever feel like that sometimes? Oh, this thing that I was counting on, it's God, it's lost. All hope is lost. Oh, God, where are you? Man, God's going to show himself in an incredible way here. Don't read ahead, guys. Don't ruin the story, okay? Don't read ahead. I know you're all going, what's going to happen? We'll cover that in a, in a, we have to wait a couple weeks now. Ben Corson is going to teach next Sunday, and then the next Sunday we'll get into the rest of Revelation 11 and wrap it up. Um, They're picking up in verse 9, but we'll see what God's got in store. And again, we serve a great God, guys. We serve an awesome God who loves you, who has done the work through his son Jesus to spare you of his judgment. Because we all deserve judgment, don't we? Because we're guilty before God. Why are we guilty? Because we are sinners. Wait a second. I haven't sinned, Brent. You don't know me. How dare you say that? Listen, the Bible says that all have fallen short. Because when you look at the law of God, 
Don't tell a lie. Don't look at another person with lust in your eyes because as adultery, you know, in your heart. When you begin to examine the law, we quickly see I'm guilty. And the Bible says if you're broken one part of it, it's as though you've broken it all. You can't pick and choose and say, I'm not that bad. I've only done just a little bit. I'm not that bad. If you've done a little bit, it means what? You're guilty before God. You're guilty because you broke his law. That's made you a sinner. We all deserve his judgment. But as we see, God has made provision for you to be spared of his judgment, for you to be saved, for you to have your sin forgiven, removed, and to bring you into a right standing with God. Your right standing does not matter or, 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 or does not, is not based on your good standing. Your right standing before God is not based on your good works, on you being a good person. Because we've already just shown now, you're guilty before God. You've broken his law. You're a sinner. You're not a good person. Let's close in prayer. We're up with that. Okay. <laughs> but... There is one that is good, Jesus Christ, who came, died on a cross for you to save you and spare you of your sin and to bring you to God by his right standing, his righteousness. And we're clothed in that now as believers in him. We now can be right with God through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. If you don't know Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, I ask you, what are you waiting for? There's not a better deal out there, guys. It's a free gift that he's given you. He's done the work for you. You can't add to it. You can't earn it. You just simply need to receive it. I hope you've received that today so that you can be in heaven with us when all this is going down on earth during the tribulation period. You don't want to be here for that. Know Jesus Christ today. Know the life he has for you. Know salvation and the forgiveness of sin through Jesus. If you don't know that, come and talk to me after. I would love to share more with you about that. Come and see me, because I want you to leave here today knowing that you know, that you know, that you know, you will be with God and Jesus in heaven for all of eternity through his work done for you. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, just come before you here, thanking you for the work you've done for us, thanking you for sparing us from our sin, from the judgment that is to come. You have done the work, Lord, and all you've asked us to do is simply acknowledge our sin and put our faith in you. What a, a blessing. What a wonderful gift that is. And we thank you for the life we have in you, the life that spares us from all these things that are, are coming. Thank you that you've been faithful, God, to get your word out, to share the gospel, even in the midst of judgment, to provide opportunity to be saved, as we see here today. Thank you that you've empowered us as well, Lord, to not just come to you, but to live these lives for you and to be a witness of you. And here on this Pentecost Sunday, we recognize the blessing, the, the gift we have in your Holy Spirit, and we do pray that you would fill us today with your Holy Spirit. We need that, Lord. We desire that. I know that I am oftentimes empty, <laughs> empty, and I have nothing in and of myself, and I need your Holy Spirit to just Fill me and overflow me and, and enable me to be that witness of you. Would you do that, Lord, here today with me, with my brothers and my sisters here this morning? Fill us today, just as you did with these two witnesses, to accomplish your work. And thank you that the work you have set out for us will be accomplished because you're going to continue on to complete that work that you began in us. Oh, we're excited for that. So help us, Lord, to just be those messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ, to get that word out so that others can be spared and saved. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.